Londoners have had to contend with many epidemics in the capital's history. This was especially the case in the 17th century when plague returned to the city. How did London's civic leaders respond to this threat? To find out, I've come to London Metropolitan Archives to meet with Tom Ferber and to look at what are rather grimly called the Bills of Mortality. So Tom, what are Bills of Mortality? So Bills is another word for a list and it's also a word for the genre. So this is a, a handbill, you know, say genre, it's the type of printing. So it's something that's printed on both sides, front and back, and the size of it as well. So this is before standard paper sizes, but a little bit smaller than an A4, A4 piece of paper. So it's a bill, and it's a bit of mortality, as the name suggests. It records causes of death within, within the capital. So the bills of mortality have been recorded parish by parish. So this allows you to track the spread of infectious diseases across the parish. And when we're talking about infectious diseases this time, we're really talking about plague. So the bill we have here is a little after the plague time, it's 1676, so 11 years after the, the Great Plague. And on this we can see it's listed the parishes that have plague and the parishes that don't. So it's an important tool for tracking the spread of plague, for early monitoring of the plague. So these days we are troublingly used to mortality statistics, but they wouldn't be presented in the same way today as there was then. This is a bit later again, but this is from the 1700s, this particular bill. And we can see round the outside, it's decorated with little skulls and skulls and crossbones, which is just very different from how we would do it now. What did London's authorities then do with this information? One of the most important uses of this information was tracking the spread of plague. So this particular bill is a bit after the Great Plague, 1676, but it still records parishes infected and parishes cleared of, of the plague. We think of plague as, you know, the Great Plague, the Black Death, obviously from a much earlier period. But it was always something in the background, and there were many um, spikes in plague numbers. There were many smaller plagues that were a feature of London life across the, across the decades. But a record like this would allow you to track what's a background level to the start of an epidemic. And there were various um, measures that were put in place if those numbers started to rise. So they were what we think of today as public health measures, Clothing, the closing of theatres is probably the best example of that. But also we would see um, people who had the means and the, and the ability to do so, they would flee. They would flee the capital at the first side of the first sign of plague. They would retire to their country estates or similar. <laughs> indeed, in, indeed. They also serve an important commercial purpose. We've, we've heard how theatres can close. We've heard how people will flee the city if there's the plague by having some seemingly objective record of plague. If there's rumour of plague, if there's misinformation, it was a way for the, sort of the powers that be to say, no, these are rumours, look, we are recording, we have information, and to sort of qualm that rumour in our knees that can, that can easily, as you'd imagine, can easily grow in a time of plague and fear. So another of the um, health measures that could be used is actually restricting the movement of, of people around, around London. So if you wanted to, so if it was deemed that your home parish was um, infected with the plague, you would not be allowed to move out of that, that area. Uh, you would require a certificate of health in order, in order to do so. And the, the bills of mortality would be the way that that would be evidenced and the way that would be supported. And even when plague wasn't the primary purpose, people are interested in other people and people are interested in the darker side of things as well. So there's a, a morbid curiosity that comes with a document like this. And we see as well people concerned about excessive drinking or disease of the soul. You know, this was a, a ripe source for the moralists of the time. Who actually compiled all this information for the parish clerks? So the, the people tasked with um, finding out the cause of death were the known as the searchers or the sworn women. So these were women, often um, older women who were, had a role in their community around sort of nursing, informal nursing and kind of informal kind of medical, medical practice. They were deemed um, sort of trustworthy and knowledgeable enough to collect this information. They weren't medical specialists in the sense we'd understand that today, but, but really by the times of the day they were, as, they were as qualified as anyone to collect that information. What do they tell us about causes of death? Quite a lot, quite a lot, but there is an element of um, decoding that, it, that is required, understanding what, what the different words mean. So on this one, for example, we can see a list of the cause of death, and these, this is by week, and it's recording the condition and then the number of people on the side. 
Some of this will be familiar to today. There's accidents are recorded, there's um, suicide is recording, it doesn't take much sort of decoding. Other things will be familiar to people that have um, perhaps some knowledge of medical history, um, but, but you might not recognise the terms, you might not recognise the terms as a layman. So things like ague for malaria, dropsy for a heart attack, for example. Other things are interesting because they, they don't describe a disease, but they describe symptoms of a disease. For example, we can hear that people might die of lethargy, people might um, die of griping in the guts, or some phrases that take a bit of translation. So rising in the lights, that's probably some kind of coughing bit. So of course you would have those symptoms um, from various different causes of death. It's the symptoms that are being recorded, not the disease. There's a few other words that probably need a little bit of decoding as well because they might be a bit confusing or misleading. One of the really sad things that comes through is just how high um, infant child mortality is in these, um, in these bills. And indeed there's sort of gradations of child mortality. There's a nuanced understanding of what that means. So one, one word that we wouldn't recognise is, is, is chrysomes. That's, um, that's a babe that's died in the first month of their life, usually before they've been baptised. There's teeth, which you would, you might naturally assume is pain in the teeth or a dental abscess. Actually, that's a child that's died before they've teethed. So if you're interested in the history of public health and medicine, what else can I find here at LMA? There's a huge amount you can, you can find here. So we have records of um, most of the major London hospitals um, going back quite often to this period and, and, and further beyond, so you can search those records. There's also records around the public health of, of, of London as well, so a step away from medicine, how London was cleaned up, how its sewers were put in, these various ways of um, preventing the spread of infectious diseases and many other themes besides. A good place to start would be um, our London Picture Archive if you want to start online, so within that you'll find pictures, images, prints, that cover all aspects of kind of health and public health in the capital. Uh, from there, it, would, it depends more on your sort of specific line of inquiry. On our website, you will find research guides, which will break that down by, by topic and give you some places to start. And of course, just come, come in and find us. Maybe have a bit of an idea of the particular area or place that you're interested in, and we can get you started and put some of these documents in your hands.